Uh, hello everyone, my name is uh, Mate Guyash, and uh, thanks for having me here and for a great conference. And uh, the title of my presentation is DevOps and Culture in Data Analytics. And in the next 20 25 minutes, I'm gonna talk about the journey we took in the last one and a half year. And I talk about where we started, where we are now, and basically, this is not a technical talk, it's about the failures that we did, the failures that I did. Uh, what I can promise, I hope you can, so you can draw some lessons, but what I can really promise is that it won't take one and a half year. I compressed it into 25 minutes because at some point we'll have to go home. So what do we do and who are we? Uh, the first company I started in two years ago is DM Lab, which is an innovative data analytics company, which has basically do two things. We have data mining, data analytical projects, and also we incubate ideas where we find the potential that they might be something valuable. And one company was Radoop, which was acquired last year by RapidMiner, and a very recent one is uh, Embrightly, which is a uh, for detection in online advertising. And what we do is uh, basically detecting bot networks and artificial traffic, which you pay for when you see in your Google Analytics, but you have no return value. That means nothing, but you still pay for that. And this is a solution we have and DM Lab and Embrightly, they are all based on some data analytics. And the story is, does not stop between boundaries of companies. This is the story what we did in the last two years, one and a half years. So, where we are, we, DM Lab was sent for data mining laboratory. And we were faculty in the Budapest University of Technology and this is a spin-off company, but we, excluding me, because I came from a different background, but the rest of the team has academic backgrounds, professors, teachers, PhD students at the university. And what we did when we started the company was prototyping consultancy and trainings and research projects. Now, the thing is with this that you have no product. So consultancy, what we do is we show prototyping, and those prototypes, they live for a month, maybe two months, but we don't have to, have to maintain them. And trainings, you do things, and you do some other things in two weeks, but also you don't maintain them. And this was true for almost everything we did. We had no product, no service. And the thing that comes from this is we never needed for investments in code because we had no code in the future, we just write them for a very short living time. And the other thing is that data mining processes are inherently stochastic and by nature are hard to test. And the other thing is that if you, if you attended any data mining laboratory, just in data analytics, the testing, unit testing, integration testing is just not in the books. People don't really talk about it and in my experience, they don't even practice that. And we all came from that. But what happened? What happened is that we had a shift towards commercial products and commercial services. And also, we went to the cloud, and that posed some problems which we had to solve. So first of all, we had problems like we had no software versions, we had no version control, we had no testing, we had dependency versions which were chaotic on the servers. We had servers and everyone had root permissions. So you can imagine everyone went and installed their own software which created like a hell. And at the end, the biggest problem was that we did not know how to ship because we never did that. So when I joined the company, I, uh, my task was to somehow create an environment and teach people how to do that, how to create a developer culture in a company which had not. But these guys were very smart. They were the best in the country, maybe even in Europe. So they were smart guys. They just had no background in what we were about to do. So, so I was there and you see, I was this very enthusiastic guy because, because imagine the situation where you're asked to do something you love and you have this playing field ahead of you. So you immediately see the things you're going to build up there, right? So you see the tools, the processes, the codification you try to do. And I was very enthusiastic because I saw all the things that, oh yeah, in one and a half year I'm going to go to this international, international conference and I'm going to talk about this magic we, we did, right? And yeah, I failed. Because people did not understand why we do it. So at some point we had testing. And one of my friends came in the morning, Monday morning, and he had his tests passed. He pushed the code into central repository. And then 
like 10 minutes later, he got an email from a guy who, who he never met called Jenkins that your, test, that your test failed. And he was like, I don't know that guy, but my test passed, but what's happening? So the problem was that I did not communicate. I did things because I thought that these are good things, but I did not communicate what are we going to do. And uh, the problem also is that I did not communicate where we are headed. So chapter two, I was the communicator. What I did is I, I always communicated what we do. I talked to people, but it wasn't just uh, one direction of communication. We, I also went to them and asked, so what is your problem? Because another problem was that I did not solve their problems. I just tried to build something but that thing had nothing to do with their problems. So the communicator, when I was this one, this guy, is that I tried to find their problems, I communicated what we did, and, well, again, I failed. Why? Because we had, we had too much changes at once. We had no time to learn them. And <clears throat> we, we realized that we need workshops and trainings so we can teach the things one step at a time. And also, what was really uh, amazing that these guys were really exciting. Just we tried to drop so many things on them at once that they were overwhelmed. And actually, personally, I made their situation even worse. I did not in improve their work. I actually ma made it worse because so many new things happened at once. So the takeaway lesson for me was, was baby steps. Right? One step at a time, a small one, which people can handle, that do not disrupt their daily works. And this was also uh, something you have to be patient because you can't just really build a Death Star by tomorrow. We had, so, because when I started, I thought like, so we start to use this tool Monday. I showed them how to do that on Monday morning. Tuesday, we use it. And Wednesday, we are senior users of the product because we use that for like 48 hours now, right? So we're experienced. So, chapter three, that I was the ghost. I tried to be invisible. Well, not in every day, but like at some point. So, I still talk to people about the steps we should take. Uh, we always said one step at a time, and that step should have been a small step. Not to disrupt, be gentle about the changes also. And it was way better, but I still failed. Lucky me, I was in a company, not in Mortal Kombat, because I would be out of the game by now. So, in chapter 3, we did fail because I did the right things now, just the presentation was bad. I did not concentrate on the real business needs. I did solve real problems, but not the ones we should have solved, right? Because now I was very enthusiastic that I can solve the problem of my colleagues. Well, but the business wasn't just really requiring regarding those problems. And also I did not understand the important problems and I will talk about a little bit later. And I did not focus on them. So the takeaway from, from that chapter was from that failure is that change what improves the most. Not the ones you want to change, not the ones you're the most excited about, but the ones that the organization needs the most or individual needs the most. And sometimes that's a conflict of interest that was a conflict of interest in, in myself because I wanted to do something, but I knew that that's not the one I should do. But my personal, my professional excitement tried to drive me that direction, but yeah. So chapter four, I was a prioritizing ghost. So I still wanted to be, do small steps, so one small step at a time, but that brings the biggest benefit in organization and the individual levels and also to communicate it, why we do it, and how we do it, and to promote what's the place we want to be in one month or in two months. Because people have to understand the whole value chain and the whole road we want to walk by together, right? And finally, we did, su we did succeed, not in the time frame that was kind of allocated to this project, but at some point we did succeed. And it's hard to define success in terms of what we do or how we do those things. The way we actually arrived at the point where we could say that we did succeed was by understanding business needs and focusing on them. Mostly these things, these changes happened in me because I was the one who tried to do this. So this was the things I understood. And to also focus on culture. And if you remember, and this will come up later, 
when I was this enthusiastic one and I tried to do, I was really excited and, and, and motivated to do all those things. I was thinking in terms of tools, processes and codification. And later on I realized that this is not about tools and codification and processes, but it's on culture and communication. And I was really bad in those things. So when we arrived and we had success that drives us, that leads us to values and how we are living up to them. And this is especially true for me. So these are the values we, the last two, I should have animation, but I don't have. So the last two is technical values, the first three is core values. This is how we label them. And I was a very integral part in defining those values. And the Nobling culture came because we wanted an environment where people can be honest and transparent about their mistakes. I mean, like, it's 10 minutes and all I'm talking about is my failures. And also the growth mindset, that it's not... The important thing is not who you are today, but who can be tomorrow. And if, even if you don't know, even if you like screwed up, it doesn't really matter until we don't go bankruptcy, but it doesn't matter because tomorrow you'll fix that and you will learn from that mistake. These are very interconnected. Honesty comes from the noble and culture. We can be honest about our mistakes, about how we did, how we screwed up, and we have the growth mindset so we can improve ourselves. Again, everything comes down, not about today, but who we are tomorrow. The technical values we have is infrastructure as cool and automation. Automation is something I truly believe in and I always promote. Because as we are a small company, you see, there are two things we do. We try to get clients and we try to survive. And automation gives us some competitive advantages we truly believe we need in order to, some, to grow something bigger. And at some point, maybe the game is not about surviving. And infrastructure as a code is also something that comes from, from DevOps culture. And this was very strange for us because you see how we operated was we SSH into a server, we did something, and then we left the server. And when we went to you, so you define the infrastructure and the configuration on your machine, people were like, wow, I want to do that on a server. But yeah, you define something on your machine, uh, that doesn't work. So that is something new for us. It's not for, new for you because you lived your whole life in this culture, but it was very new for us. And so also the, the thing is that we changed a lot in our culture. We changed a lot in how we operate. But the biggest change happened to me because I screwed up so many times. And the things I learned, and this is where animation should really go. So the one thing I, I have was patience, right? Because I was really, very motivated, very excited. So I thought, okay, everyone, everyone is excited. I'm excited, so you should be excited. And by tomorrow, we'll have this Death Star build. So I'm just pushing a button, everything's happened. But this is not how real life works. Also, understanding the important problems is hard. But to find the root causes in those, hard prob in those important problems is even harder. Because you have to think through the whole value chain. And I was a technical guy, so the whole value chain I thought about was tools and servers. The saddest realization was my own ego was a problem. And this was the thing you, that took a while to actually accept that one of the obstacles we, po we had was myself. Because I was an enthusiastic one, and I, in, I, I thought I was thinking in terms of tools and processes. And also the communication, when I said, one of the lessons I learned is that DevOps is about communication because I, I came from a strong developer culture, so I thought everyone understand the values I try to promote. And when people's, people did not follow what we like set out, I was this guy who went out and said, yeah, I'm, I'm angry, I'm angry, but you know, I'm not going to show because I know I have to be patient. So I went there and said, oh, you screwed up again, but hey, no problem. I mean, yeah, I can show you like the fifth time, no problem. And I said those things and I meant them. But actually, what Sabina said yesterday, that I thought I'm communicating the you're okay and I'm okay part, but in reality, my frustration was still visible. And the fact that people felt that I'm communicating that I'm okay, but you're not okay because, I mean, God, this is the second time. And that was really hard to change. And I will talk about later, a little later that what's really, really amazing is how much I learned from DevOps. And also, the culture is key, which is all talk about, and I talked about that. But when I said living up to our values, I said those things, the noble culture, but my frustration was visible. When I said honesty, but I wasn't really honest. And also, culture is the key. I mean, one and a half year ago, I would do this presentation, I would put up these keywords also. But the fact is, the things I did every day wasn't really showing that. 
I always have this I always have this analogy about how we change things, and I like to have this Git analogy. You have the Git pool, right? It's DevOps pool. This is when you this is when you when you have something very exciting and to adapt things, people don't really have any conflict with their current workflow. So I'm as I always say, tools are important, but I'm gonna give you give you I don't know, give you examples from tools. So there's this tool called JQ, which is a which is a JSON tool in the command line. I use a lot of JSON. So Git pool is when you're basically all you do is just to like show yourself that hey, this is this new cool tool. So you, hey, do you want to use it? And people, you can see the sparkling in their eyes. And JQ was a great example. The Git, the Git pool because they just pulled it in. I just showed them, hey, did you see that? And they went back, and I like I saw in his eyes that they are trying the thing because it's so exciting. And I had I did not do too much. I just showed them. But there is the, there's the push one, right? When you have to be a little bit more aggressive, not aggressive in the common sense, but a bit more aggressive than doing nothing. So like feature branches. So we use Git, which is also a very, very long story. But <laughs> but. Um, so we used Git, and at some point we wanted to use feature branches, but that, that somehow it had no traction. We always had conflicts on the on the main main uh, on the master branch, and so Git push is when you when you like try to push them a little bit, they still see the benefits, but a little bit they it conflicts with their workflow, and you have to push a little bit to like just to get over that, right? And sometimes it does not work. Sometimes you have things you know you have to do and people don't won't really just accept it, they won't really implement it. But by experience or by other thing you know you have to do that and yeah that's what we don't do, right? Well I, I did this morning but I mean this we really do. But this is when you push minus F and you just have force and you push that through. And one example we had is we we introduced Slack, which is a communication tool. I know, I, I'm, I'm sure we probably all know. We all use emails, and emails are very bad for a lot of reasons. But my problems, my problem was with email. It's exclusive. So in email, we had email threads, and all everyone who was on the thread knew about the things we talked about in the email thread, and no one else. And uh, transparency is one thing we promote. Not even just in our marketing, but also in our inner, uh, inner culture, and it had no transparency because people, who, people who were who were not on the recipient list, were excluded from the communication and from the thread. So we introduced Slack because in Slack you have these channels and people can join in. They can see we have people who are working from London or from York actually, and and they can see what's happening. In the office, and it's amazing. And also, you can like insert gifs, cat gifs, which are pretty cool. And also, this was something we knew we had to do, but people just—they were just still using emails. And we said, well, from now on, you only can send email if there's an external recipient on the list. So people started to use Slack, and at first, they were—they weren't really happy about that. But this was uh, this was something that we knew that we have to do. And that was the last model, where we said, yeah, at some point you're going to like it. But this is, this is something very, very risky. Because when you do this, you have to know that you're, you, you put risk something very fundamental, and that's trust. Because if you do this, and you push something through people, you can do that because you have the authorization, or you have the authority or something, you can do that, but you risk trust. Because if it turns out good, people will trust you from now on, because, well, Next time you try to save something or you just try to introduce something new, be it as a tool, be it as a process, be it as something new in the culture, which is very complex, but you can do. They will say, well, I don't really like to do that, but the next time we'll say, well, the last time. But think about the other part, when you fail. You push something through them, you fail with that, things are not going out quite well. Next time they will say, well, last time. And when they they don't lose trust in you, but they lose their trust in your judgment. And that's something very hard to, to get back. Maybe it's not even possible. So, as I always say, tools are not that important, but just to show you how much we actually improved. Uh, we, this is what we needed. We need separated environments because all those dependencies are things. We had to support Windows. We wanted to enable developers, data scientists to work offline if possible. 
And the tools we have now, they are quite modern, you can say, but it was a long road. I mean, this is what we use now, but imagine that one and a half year ago, we sent modifications in our code in email. And our version control system was timestamped zip files. So it was a long process. And without the developer culture, so it was, it was something that I'm very proud of that as a team we could do. So we use Slack, that I talked about that. We use now code review uh, via pull requests because uh, this is how we want to distribute knowledge in our team. We use Vagrant because we want to support Windows. So what people do, we use Docker in development. So MySQL, Docker, and Windows users just use a Vagrant image to launch Dockers. We use Ansible, and we use Ansible because that's Ansible, we love that. Terraform is something new we introduced in approximately like four months ago, so we're definitely experienced in that. And Packer, which is uh, still not in production, and our very basic uh, modus operandi is that we push a code into a feature branch, we do a pull request, we do this thumbs up, best part of the job, and then we Jenkins builds a new staging infrastructure with Terraform. Packer clears these Amazon images because, by the way, we're on Amazon. And then, if it's, everything is okay, it gets an okay stamp, and the AMI goes into production. We kill the server we have now, and we bring up a new server with the new Amazon image. We also have immutable infrastructure, which is also a very good thing. So, finally, what I wanted to talk about is this thing, and I'm very, I was very glad that Avish said yesterday that DevOps is different for different people. And this is, this is very true. And also it's about learning. And I, I had this idea like one and a half year ago that at some point I'm going to go to an international conference and talk about these things we did. And I'm going to talk about Terraform, Docker, and things like that. And you see, I all talked about like 40 seconds. Because what I learned is DevOps is, is a culture, and it's about the people. And DevOps is different for you and different for you. But it's even different for me, because one and a half year ago, DevOps was tools for me, and these death stars, and automation, and pushing a button, and then, I don't know, everything magically happens. And I arrived because the environment changed, and I changed, and I learned, and probably I get more mature, and DevOps is now a culture, and it's about the people who I work with, and these are the people I work with. I'm pretty happy we have live streaming, probably I'm fired by now. So, it was a very interesting learning experience. DevOps, what I love DevOps is still part of the tools, but, but why I love DevOps because it showed how much I have to learn, it showed about my weaknesses, about how I have to learn, and I learned a lot from that process. And as a team, we evolved. Now I can say we have DevOps capabilities, but that was a long journey. I learned a lot from, from, uh, from, uh, about my team, but especially about myself. Thank you very much. Oh, you do. Yeah, so, um, I really relate to the part that you, where you talk about uh, how culture is more important than tooling. Um, my experience is that a lot of times tooling get in the way, uh, in the sense that, for example, with one company we worked for, uh, worked with, okay, uh, we introduced chat, and the end result was that only operations people knew and handled infrastructure, and developers lost all capability to touch anything. Uh, they were no, no, no longer able to touch staging, or sometimes even development, because they didn't know chef. So it got to the point where we told them, you know what, maybe you should just manage your servers using Maven, because otherwise developers won't be able to, to do anything. So um, my thoughts about this is that those tools need to be, you know, um, you need to get them to the entire company because the um, sort of the language, the like common language, that everybody speaks. Um, so I would really like to hear your thought about this and, and how it was for you to introduce new tooling into to the company and the traction that you got or didn't get. Yeah. So I completely agree with you. So and this is something you have to think about that. If you think the tool is a great idea on the organization level, is it still a good idea? 
I mean, it might seem like a good idea for me or for Davos, but not for everyone. We failed at some tools. So we had some tools that was exactly what you said that we introduced and we realized that it just, it just it gets in the way. The problem was that this was hard for people without a strong experience in, in operations or stuff to understand why those tools. And Chef was an example. So Chef was for we use Ansible because people actually loved Ansible because it was easy for them to understand. It was not far from best scripts and they knew best scripts because they behold all those web, shop, web uh, uh, workshops. Actually, most of the guys are on Windows now, many of them on Linux, so they do some bash programming. I think, the thing is, I think it's true, but it, you would ask me how you should know that upfront, probably by experience. I have some experience, probably I would still go to that end. By trying. We try small, we try with a few individuals, and then if we fail, that tool goes out of the window and we try something new. I don't know if it answers your question. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.